Today we celebrate Mother's Day, as you probably have guessed, receiving a flower from our, from our group here, and just want to talk a little bit about Mother's Day today. It was created by a woman named Anna Jarvis, and this is interesting, it really wasn't as long ago as you think. Uh, Mother's Day became an official holiday in 1908. Now that sounds like a long time ago, maybe for some folks, but you know, that was just a little over a hundred years ago. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I always think in terms of 1776 or something like that, but 1908, uh, Anna Jarvis finally got that on the, on the uh, calendar as a national holiday. It, it's, its roots, though, go back further than that. You go back about 50 years before that, you go back to the days of the Civil War, uh, and uh, before the Civil War, right before it, uh, there was uh, what they what they were what they called Mother's Day work clubs, and what these were designed to do. And think about this. Think about this as pre Civil War, uh, a while back. The Mother's Day work clubs were designed to help women to learn how to properly care for their children. And so it was understood even all the way back then that you know just by birthing a child didn't necessarily mean that, that uh, one knew how to care properly for the child. Uh, and so they had these Mother's Day work clubs. In 1868, uh, there was the Mother's Friendship Day. Now this is after the Civil War is over. And so if you think in your wildest dreams that the Civil War was fought and the North won and that was the end of it and we all became one big happy nation, then you don't know your history very well. Mother's Friendship Days, uh, or the Mother, Mother's Friendship Day was instituted in 1868. Mothers gathered uh, from the former Union uh, and Confederate, uh, well, at least they were considered nations during the Civil War, and they, they strove to bring together soldiers uh, from that war to promote reconciliation and, uh, you know, met some success. In 1908, now we're jumping forward to the 20th century, uh, after her mother's death, Anna Jarvis, uh, uh, who, who interestingly enough remained unmarried and childless her whole life, resolved to add Mother's Day as a holiday. And so it's interesting to see how that was on behalf of a daughter who loved her mother uh, and wanted to, uh, to, to uh, continue this tradition then of women working together to try to bring reconciliation to the nation. Uh, she argued that most American holidays up to that time were biased toward male achievements. And so in, in 1912, there was this massive letter writing campaign. And finally in 1914, Woodrow Wilson officially established uh, perpetually uh, every year uh, in the second Sunday in May, this holiday, Mother's Day. So I guess it is it officially being recognized not as a one-off thing, but as something that the nation would recognize every year, every year that didn't come until about 1914. Now Jarvis, Anna Jarvis, she was an interesting character, as you can probably guess. Uh, she supported Mother's Day, she loved Mother's Day up until a certain date, up until around 1920, so she at least got six years out of it. All during those six years, uh, she worked at a floral uh, company, and her big, her big, and you know, I, I had forgotten this or didn't even know it, uh, traditionally to celebrate Mother's Day, uh, what people were called to do was to, to personally visit their mother, to make that personal connection, so I guess even back then they probably had trouble with that. Right? You don't have a holiday or make a suggestion unless people's tendency is to not do so. But get together, see your mother, spend personal time with your mothers, but also get to church. Remember, it was the second Sunday of May. And so that is an excellent day to attend church, hopefully with your mother, and wear a white carnation. We're probably going to find out that Anna was very successful because after... 1920, she looked around and she realized that what had been an original thought of hers to celebrate her mother's life 
and to celebrate mothers everywhere and to carry on this tradition from the Civil War became commercialized. Commercialized. And she looked around and she became absolutely disgusted with the florists selling flowers, the confectioners selling candy, and the card companies yeah. capitalizing on Mother's Day. I guess that must have really grinded her gears, so to speak. She, here she wanted to have this, this uh, you know, wonderful, celebratory, personal, always emphasis on personally seeing your mother and loving your mother and caring for your mother, this personal commitment and goal to spend time with her. And as I guess human nature is, uh, we just decided we were going to buy cards, candy, and flowers, and maybe not necessarily see mom. This is, this is all happening back in 1920. And so she turned on Mother's Day. And she got to the point where she despised Mother's Day. In 1948, so that's 28 years later, she officially disowned the holiday. She tried to get it removed from the calendar, and she spent most of her personal fortune on lawyers to try to get it done. I'm sure that was a very spunky woman. <laughs> try to think your great-grandmother, if you remember your great-grandmother at all, that's probably her generation. I would imagine they were probably no-nonsense folks that had a very deep commitment to what they believed. And so, you know, whether that's, whether you enjoy that story or not, that's the reality of it. But what did Anna know? What did Anna Jarvis know? And I've, I've said it now a few times. The desire to have a personal relationship with those people around us. Because remember, initially it wasn't just you celebrate your mother. It was mothers everywhere. It was teaching mothers prior to the Civil War to learn how to care for their children properly, how to feed them, clothe them, nurture them, and love them. And then after the Civil War, it was used to try to get Union and Confederate soldiers together, realizing that the common commonality of, of, of their mothers might be able to do it. You've heard the stories of families being split between the North and the South, where in that much time, all of a sudden, ones were in the blue and ones were in the gray, and they're shooting at one another at Bull Run, and they're related. That happened in, if you've ever studied the Civil War, you will know that. What did Anna know? The personal need and desire to lift up our mothers and to celebrate their lives and their relationships with children and community. And that's where I want to go to our first lesson for today, our first reading for today from Acts chapter 17. What's going on here? What's going on in the first reading for today? Well, what is Paul seeing? He's, he's visited the Areopagus, and I don't know why I, I remember that, because I think of the, the critter from Sesame Street, the Snuffleupagus, and it helps me remember. But the Areopagus, and... What's on display? Gods. All around the courtyard, there's gods on display. Statue after statue, after statue after statue of gods, Greek gods, Roman gods, all kinds of kind of gods. And these, these Athenians, they are so fractious. This is where we get a lot of our Greek philosophy from. They're so fractious and they love to argue so much that they even decided to leave one pedestal empty to the unknown God. And that's when Paul visits, and Paul tries to remind the people of what this is all about. God's on display, as if gods are a commodity, as if gods are like flowers or candy or greeting cards. We can try them on for size and see how they fit, and if these gods don't uh, take care of our, our personal desires and wants, then we can cast one off and get another one. And here comes Paul with this incredible revolutionary message of there only being one God, one God, and then lifting up Jesus Christ. And so in verse 27, he says, though indeed, talking about God, indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. 
Now, I would dare say, even though it seems strange to us, that several of those gods there at the Areopagus were female. There's that desire within human nature to connect with, with the nurturing love of a mother figure. That's what some of those old gods were about from the Greek and the Roman pantheons and stuff, was, was worshiping the feminine aspect of humanity. Isn't it interesting what Paul does? And Paul is very clever in doing this. He, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And notice that that verse is in quotes, which means Paul is quoting something else. And Paul says, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Paul is trying to get the Greeks and the Romans to wake up and see something that is very true. First of all, he's trying to abolish this idea that, you know, you can just try gods on like pairs of shoes, like we might in our lives feel as though we can try people on like pairs of shoes or clothing, and if we don't love them, if something happens, we can discard them and throw them aside. No, Paul is trying to get them to realize that you are God's children. And he's quoting their own scriptures, in a sense, or their own philosophy, which is genius. Because remember, Paul says, I, I will become all things to all people. He says, to the Greek, I will become like a Greek. To the Hebrew, I will become like a Hebrew. To the slave, I will become like a slave. To the free man, I will become like a free man. I will become all things to all people so that I may win some to Christ. Paul puts the theology of Jesus Christ before all other things. But he realizes that you can't tear someone's nose off before you ask them to smell your robes. They won't be able to do it. They won't be in the mood for it. And so in verse 29, since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. No, what is it? God is our Father. God has the motherly characteristics in Him we move and live and have our being wrapped in that warm, nurturing love of perhaps a mother. Paul is doing all these things very intentionally today in our first reading to, to win some to Christ. And we know it works. We know it works because it isn't very long then after Acts chapter 17 that Paul begins to pen First and Second Corinthians to the church in Corinth which is in Greece. You see how it works. You get your foot in the door, and then it's the milk and the meat of the gospel, right? You start the baby off with the milk, and then once the baby tastes the milk and sees, yes, that it is good, then there is the meat of the gospel, which I think sometimes is where we as Lutherans are. We have a very deep and intrinsic theology Let's go to our gospel for today. We see something else here in John chapter 14. And Jesus says to the disciples, because he's, he's about ready to leave. He'll be gone soon. He's going to be killed on the cross. He's going to rise from the dead. He's going to ascend to the right hand of God the Father. And he sees the fear beginning to rise in his disciples. He can tell they're, they're going to be separated from the one that they love. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask my Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Isn't it interesting, the language in verse 18, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. I'm sure that Anna Jarvis, uh, back in, uh, prior to the Civil War in 1868, that was one of her concerns with the children that were left. Uh, in the devastation of the Civil War was that they not be orphaned, but that they be gathered up and loved. I will not leave you orphaned, I am coming to you. And if we think about the nature of the Holy Spirit, yes, the Holy Spirit is fire, yes, the Holy Spirit is wind, yes, the Holy Spirit is that which motivates us, but do not forget, once again, Paul's words, the Spirit intercedes for us 
with sighs too deep for words to express. In other words, the Spirit is so intrinsic in our being, if we allow the Spirit to be, that when we offer up a prayer to God on high, the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words to express. In other words, you don't have to have a solid gold five-star vocabulary in order to talk with God. You've heard me say it before, and I'll say it again. All you have to do is go. And the Holy Spirit hears it, the Holy Spirit knows it, and even that prayer goes to God. See, that's what the Greeks need to know in the first reading for today. And then finally, our second reading, 1 Peter chapter 3. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? Why is Mother's Day so valuable? Or why should it be so valuable? Now, are mothers everywhere perfect? Of course not. Right? We, we can probably all think back when our mothers had a really bad day and maybe she said something or she did something, but hopefully within that, or hopefully what we, what we model and mirror for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, is this, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? And so if you continue to do what is good, in the end, it will reign supreme. And that will be what people remember. Gosh, I just remember that day I had with mom. It just came out of the blue. We went to the park, and we walked for a few hours, and she told me things. And I'll never forget that day. Or whatever. See, it's not about the big fancy things. It's not about the cards. It's not about the confectionaries. It's not about the flowers. It's what Paul knows from the get-go, and hopefully we hear. It's about time. It's about being relational with one another, being in that relationship. That's what will get your young people's attention, and that's what they will remember. Once, once the Christmas toys are used up and thrown away or stored in a closet, it's going to be what you said that morning, what you did that morning, that they're going to remember. And I think that's part and parcel of Mother's Day and what it's about. So, Congratulations to Anna for, in 1908, for starting a wonderful holiday, even if it turned into something that she didn't like. But even think about that. Her anger was righteous. It's about loving and caring for one another. It's about relationships. Let's not lose track of that today or in the days ahead. Amen.